I, I suspect that the so-called BRICS currency will evolve, if it does, into a settlement mechanism as opposed to a currency. And I think, ironically, that the BRICS currency will, at least for the balance of my lifetime, be valued and exchangeable for U.S. dollars is substantially constrained. So a circumstance that caused a complete erosion of confidence and a liquidity squeeze really scares me. Uh, what scares me probably the most in that context in the United States is the proliferation of high yield junk bond ETFs. There's a whole generation of Americans that have become yield chasers because of artificially low yields, and they're taking credit risks. The BRICS countries are actively pursuing the establishment of a distinct currency separate from the US dollar, potentially backed by gold. Central banks in the East are increasing their gold reserves, suggesting a move toward a gold-backed currency. Discussions about de-dollarization and the potential inclusion of new members like Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the bloc indicate a gradual shift away from the dollar as the global reserve currency. Due to their inverse relationship, this transition might weaken the dollar and drive investments into gold. Rick Rule, the founder of Rule Investment Media, speculates that the proposed BRICS currency might not function as a typical currency, but could evolve into more of a settlement mechanism. He believes this currency might remain closely tied to the value of the US dollar, at least during his lifetime. Despite an optimistic view on stocks due to potential Federal Reserve interest rate cuts, Wall Street analysts express concerns about looming risks as 2024 approaches. According to a recent Business Insider report, these analysts foresee a surge in stock values in the coming year, driven by the prospect of Fed rate cuts. However, exemplary signals suggest possible obstacles hindering a robust upswing in 2024. These obstacles include the possibility of a recession, a growing debt bubble, a significant correction in the S&P 500, and unforeseen black swan events. Rick shares concerns about unforeseeable black swan events that could undermine market confidence, reminiscent of the liquidity crisis observed in 2008. He highlights the current limitations governments face in addressing such events, especially considering the substantial increase in government debt compared to 2008. Additionally, the growing presence of high-yield junk bond ETFs in the U.S. market amplifies potential risks associated with these financial instruments, raising concerns about potential repercussions. We'll be sharing clips from Rick Rule's interview with ITM Trading. But before that, if you'd like more videos, please subscribe and turn on the notification bell for updates. Thank you, and enjoy the video. Uh, I, I suspect that the so-called BRICS currency will evolve, if it does, into a settlement mechanism as opposed to a currency. And I think, ironically, that the BRICS currency will, at least for the balance of my lifetime, be valued <laughs> and exchangeable for U.S. dollars. Uh, I think the president of Argentina at once made an ideological choice uh, to align himself with what is still a freer society than the BRICS society. At the same time, he paid attention to arithmetic. Uh, there is no debt market in BRICS. There isn't a real debt market in Yuan. Uh, the BRICS, well, first of all, it doesn't exist, but it isn't convertible yet. Uh, there, there is no depth. I, I remember once Doug Casey saying to me, uh, and to you, I think, in, in a conference, the U.S. dollar is an IOU nothing. The euro, with 17 or 18 backers, is a who owes you nothing. The BRICS, with such stalwart credits, <laughs> as formerly Argentina, <laughs> and if you look at who's applying to join it, uh, would likely be fashioned a nobody owes you anything. Remember that an unbacked currency is just that, an unbacked currency. Uh, and imagine, uh, if you will, in the BRICS, let's say that China runs a trade surplus with Russia. And at the end of the year, uh, Mr. Xi uh, goes up to Moscow with a billion bricks uh, and said, I'd, uh, this is gold backed, I'd like my gold. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Putin says, no, I think you should keep your bricks. Uh, how is Mr. Xi going to enforce convertibility unless the gold has already been surrendered from a sovereign holder to a central repository? which none of the BRICS nations, with the exception of China, are willing to do. And China is willing to do it if the repository is in China. The idea 
that one or more black swans that we may or may not be able to identify ahead of time reduces faith in the market to the extent that there's a liquidity squeeze circa 2008. It's important to note that when the 2008 event took place, government debt as a percentage of GDP was around 25%. Government debt as a percentage of GDP is 110% today. So the amount of stimulus, the amount of printing that the government could do, the amount of spending that the government could do in the face of a liquidity event like 2008 is substantially constrained. So a circumstance that caused a complete erosion of confidence and a liquidity squeeze really scares me. Uh, what scares me probably the most in that context in the United States is the proliferation of high yield junk bond ETFs. There's a whole generation of Americans that have become yield chasers because of artificially low yields, and they're taking credit risks that they don't understand. The ETFs themselves are highly liquid. They trade billions and billions of dollars a day in $10,000 and $20,000 instruments. Their owners, I think, are naive with regards to credit. Uh, the underlying instruments that those ETFs own, over-the-counter junk bonds, are highly illiquid. And a circumstance where there was a concern about credit, like we saw in 2008 with mortgage-backed securities, that caused the retail holders of these credit instruments to sell them and caused the ETFs to have to sell the underlying assets to satisfy the redemptions. When an ETF gets sold and the manager must redeem, he or she uh, must sell the underlying assets. And if the underlying assets are illiquid, it gives rise to what we used to cynically call an owl bond. An owl bond is when the owl bond. An owl bond is when the portfolio manager calls the broker and says, "Sell this bond," and the broker says, "To who? To who?" And that truly terrifies me. The idea that three trillion dollars uh, in junk bond ETFs face a disintermediation phase, and the managers can't sell the underlying instruments. Uh, that keeps me awake. And what? potential for some what? moron to chuck some nuclear instrument at some other moron. Lower nominal interest rates have the potential to impact bank profitability negatively. As rates decrease, banks may find it challenging to lower deposit rates beyond zero, reducing net interest income and shrinking markups as interest rates decline. Furthermore, low short-term rates and a flattened yield curve can erode returns from maturity transformation, this scenario can hinder loan supply if lower bank profitability restricts net interest margins, possibly leading to a reversal interest rate, where accommodative monetary policies become contractionary. Rick Rule highlights that lowering nominal interest rates alleviates certain crises within the banking sector, essentially supporting banks at the expense of depositors and redirecting funds from depositors to bolster banks. However, when interest rates rise, banks experience increased capital costs, while their return on invested capital diminishes. Consequently, if loan portfolios were marked to market, numerous banks might be deemed insolvent, although the Federal Reserve doesn't mandate such marking. Rick suggests that reducing interest rates could benefit banks by lowering their capital costs and boosting the nominal value of their bond portfolios. This move might indicate the Fed's aim to reinvigorate the U.S. banking sector, possibly achieving some success by 2024. Nevertheless, he remains skeptical about whether this would truly restore confidence in the banking sector, indicating that this restored confidence might be misplaced. Let's get back to the interview. In the very near term, some of the crisis in the banking sector uh, gets uh, alleviated with lower nominal interest rates, uh, which means that we bail out the banks uh, at the hands of the depositors. We take money from the depositors and we give it to the banks. One of the great... Uh, crosses that the banking industry has to bear is their own historic greed, where the banking industry uh, had very short-term deposits and they lent money for a time spread on long-term assets. When the interest rate rose, their cost of capital increased well, to the point where if you take many banks in the country right now and you look at their loan portfolios and mark them to market, which by the way, the Fed doesn't require them to do, they're in fact insolvent. If you lower the interest rate, it lowers their cost of capital at the same time as it increases the nominal value of their bond portfolios. 
So one of the things that I think that the Fed is attempting to do is to reflate the banking sector in the United States. And I suspect that for calendar 2024, they'll be uh, successful in doing that. Uh, there are a group of banks out there that are actually well capitalized. Uh, the FDIC says a well capitalized bank has assets of 7% uh, relative equity of 7% relative to total assets. I prefer a number more like 10. Uh, there are uh, community banks, uh, as an example, Bank of Hemet in California, uh, with uh, equity at 15%. There are bigger regional banks, Farmers and Merchants Bank of Long Beach, First National Bank of Alaska come to mind, with equity at 20% of total assets. Uh, I don't believe that people probably, uh, for the next year, need to worry too much but I wouldn't want to have more than $250,000 on deposit at any one bank. And I would select banks that are well capitalized. I also think that depositors, although they don't want to, they want Rick Rule to tell them where to bank and Daniela Camboni to tell them where to bank. I think that depositors need to get from their institution something called a statement of financial condition. I don't think that, there's a, that there is a place on big bank balance sheets for speculative positions and derivatives. I think derivatives have a place to hedge interest rate risks, both on the deposit side and the liability side of banks' balance sheets. But I don't think that banks ought to be speculating or trading in derivatives for their own account. The idea that a big, big, big bank has nominal value of $50 trillion of derivatives against a $500 billion balance sheet is a true insanity. The banks will say, well, this is a nominal valuation that one side of the derivative trade offsets the other side of the derivative trade. Yeah, if everybody pays. Looking ahead, the shift in global currencies and the potential rise of a new financial mechanism hint at a transformative phase in the economic landscape. While optimism surrounds stock markets due to anticipated Federal Reserve interventions, caution prevails amidst looming uncertainties. Given the shifting financial landscape and looming uncertainties, how do you foresee preparing for and navigating potential risks in the global economy? Share your observations in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.